Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi, uh, I'm Frank, and this is Kelsey. Hello. And I'm uh, I just knocked the HDMI cord out, so maybe <laughs> it will fix itself momentarily. Cool. Uh, and we are here with uh, the Video Game History Foundation, which is a nonprofit uh, dedicated to preserving the history of video games. Uh, what we'd like to tell people is that our mission is to make sure that historians have the tools that they need to tell the story of video games. Um, and part of what we do each year at Portland Retro Gaming Expo, uh, starting last year, sort of with like a soft launch, I guess, yes. it's sort of our first real year doing this, is we do the museum. Uh, has anyone been in the museum this year? Show hands. That's like everyone. That's great. That's awesome. Good. The rest of you, there's pictures. It's okay. You didn't have to go. But you should go anyway after the panel. Um, so, uh, you know, I wanted to show this year the what we call the first 35 years of the NES and I kind of wanted to challenge the way we think of the NES because I, I, I believe that it's kind of become a, a, a sort of collector centric view of the history of the system but it's so much more than that and it drives me crazy that people's perspectives sometimes are so limited to what the NES is. And I think that goes for just about anything that goes in a museum. I mean when you think of a museum you probably are thinking of like priceless artifacts and that's not necessarily, it doesn't all have to be priceless artifacts to be important in telling a story and educating, right? Uh, no, totally, yeah. Um, so, you know, as you'll see, we kind of did some photo printouts and things like that, but I, I wanted to not just challenge how people think of the NES, but I kind of want to challenge how we traditionally have museums at shows like this because traditionally it's what you're talking about, right? It's like, right. here's the rarest collectibles. It's a $15,000 cartridge here and a yeah. thousand dollars. I mean, and we have that there too. There is sure. stadium events is there and Nintendo World Championship is there. I, but get, I get bored by that stuff. But <laughs> yeah, it, there's, that's a very small part of the overarching story. Yeah. So what I thought I would do for this panel is uh, I didn't really have too much opportunity to like give people tours and expand on what we were trying to say. So this is kind of a virtual tour with Frank and Kelsey of this exhibit we put together. So um, we have some photos roughly in chronological order and I think we're just gonna kind of go through the museum. Um, Kelsey, you want to talk about some early day stuff here? Yeah, so Nintendo, as you guys might know, is a company that goes all the way back to the 19th century in Japan. It's a very, very old company, and they obviously did not start making video games, nor were they even a popular company. They when didn't they make started. video games in 1896. They did not make video games in <laughs> Why not? 1880s. Um, but, so you, if you go back. Um, Far to, you know, to the very beginning, it was a mom and pop store that manufactured Hanafuda cards, which are a type of playing card uh, used in Japan. So then they move on to Western playing cards. They were the first company in Japan to make and distribute Western playing cards, you, you know, just like a standard deck of cards as we know it here. Um, and they moved on from that to a bunch of just kind of random toys. In fact, that roulette one even, we. They, that was distributed in America. One of those, was, uh, yeah. I believe, the uh, the right, the one on the right. You guys see this really old Nintendo game logo? It's really like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so some of this stuff was distributed overseas, but to very very limited success. I mean, this is just kind of them throwing things out there and seeing what sticks. With the exception of Western playing cards, sure. that was a pretty that was a pretty big deal. Quick side note. Um, the electronic love tester here is owned by our friend Steve Lynn. This was brought to my wedding, and uh, we do not have Nintendo's approval. <laughs> <laughs> so incompatible, you're not even sure it worked. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and so, you know, we want to kind of start the, the story here at about 1980, right? And, and, and what we wanted to express was that, yeah, Nintendo is this very old Japanese company. They've done a lot of sort of toys and cards and things. and. Uh, their biggest success at the start of the decade is uh, what's called the Game & Watch, which we kind of have a couple of examples of here. Um, and the Game & Watch is uh, this portable little LCD. Like, you, you guys ever played games like this? Uh, like LCD games where it's just, it's just some black lines that move around very, you know, suddenly, right? Um, Nintendo was one of the earliest uh, game makers of, of those types of games, and the Game & Watch was you know, a very early sort of portable system. And the designer, uh, Gunpei Yokoi, 
was inspired by writing the subway, and he was seeing that people were just kind of playing with their calculators to pass time, kind of the way we do now with our phones, you know, yeah, I guess, kind but, of randomly. but doing multiplication better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I do on the subway. Um, and so he's like, there, there's something here, right? So, um, so that was a really big hit, uh, toy-wise, for Nintendo uh, here in Japan, right? Yes. And um, but. They did, but, and they were doing some arcade games and stuff like that. Nothing really spectacular until they had uh, one really big hit, which was Donkey Kong. Um, you guys probably heard the Donkey Kong story a million times on Nintendo. Uh, too many copies of Radar Sculpt, and so a young designer named Shigeru Miyamoto. And, uh, maybe you don't know this? Okay, yeah, so <laughs> actually, okay, that's actually the story. So, so Nintendo had this game called Radar Scope, and they're like, oh, this is the hot stuff. Everyone's going to love Radar Scope. Let's order like a million units. It's not literally a million, but like many units of this to America. Everyone's going to go crazy, and then no one wanted it. Well, and, not only that, I mean, it took forever yes. to get to America. So by the time, you know, this is shipping via boat from Japan. So right. by the time it got there, all the hype was gone, if there was any. Yeah. Um, all the radar and, scope yeah. people lining up. <laughs> and it was doors. just, yeah, you know, just meh, and they had all these extra units. It's not a very good game. <laughs> and um, so, so Shigeru Miyamoto, he was a design, designer who was sort of recently hired. He never worked on a game before, I don't think. And, and he was tasked with, like, we need you to design a game that uses all this radar scope hardware that we have to, like, replace the boards and make it run. So he designed Donkey Kong. Which I'm going to assume everyone knows what Donkey Kong is. They're not going to explain Donkey Kong, and it was a, it was a big hit. And and um, what we're trying to show with this museum exhibit is just the extent of Donkey Kong fever in, in 1981 in America. Like there were, you know, there were trading cards. Uh, there were these little toys. I, lo I love this Pauline one, the little cabinet. That's my favorite. Um, there was uh, yeah, that's an arcade player. This. Uh, is, is from the Foundation's collection. This is an animation drawing of Donkey Kong from the Donkey Kong cereal commercial. It's a priceless artifact there. Um, and actually, uh, to sort of tie this together a little bit, and we'll get back to this later, there's a Donkey Kong Game & Watch. And, uh, and you might notice this little uh, crosshair thing here. This is the introduction of the D-pad, the directional pad. And so, uh, with this success uh, sort of happening, um, Nintendo decides, hey, you know, we, we have this game now that's huge. Uh, we're starting to, you know, actually find our groove with software, right? We're making hit games. They, they have made Mario Brothers by this point, I think, and uh, Donkey Kong Jr., Popeye. Um, we should make a home system like, like, a, like Atari in America does. And, and so they were uh, basically the, the family computer here, the Famicom. Uh, I like to think of it as Donkey Kong plus Game & Watch, right? It's, it's, uh, they, they, they designed a system that would play a fairly accurate version of Donkey Kong at home. And then for the control mechanism, I mean, I just read this recently, I thought it was really cool, that like, they didn't know what the, the, what the control input device was, and they just kind of grabbed some Game & Watch parts off the shelf, and they had a D-pad, and they're like, oh, this is right. So like, that's where the NES D-pad came from, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah, so this was sort of, they, they understood that they could make electronics that were successful, uh, even globally, the Game & Watch was a global success, and they understood that they could make good games now, and so the, this was like a, a, like you said, like a combination yeah. of the two, bring it home. Yeah, and it was, you know, kind of a slow burn, but like it became a huge hit. I mean, it was instantly the best-selling console in Japan, but... What was it even competing against? Like the Epoch? The so, SG-1000. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> oh, actually, yeah, that's funny. Literally that's same day. Literally release. same day release as the Sega's SG-1000. Yeah, Nintendo so if you guys them. don't know what that is, Sega, um, before the Master System, had another console in Japan called the SG-1000, and it's much less powerful than the NES, uh, at least yeah. graphically. So it looks a lot more like an Intellivision type thing, and they released on the exact same day in Japan, and yeah. that did not go over well, so... No. <laughs> uh, Girls Garden is a great game for that system. Look it up. Yuji Naka's first game, the Sonic the Hedgehog programmer. Anyways, um, so yeah, we kind of wanted to show, you know, like I, I had never seen all the Famicom hardware together in one place before. So like, again, it's the family computer, right? And 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 unlike the NES, they really went for that. You know, like so right around. You can see. Okay, good. You can see this. So this is the disc drive, the Famicom disc system, and they. They, uh, they had some games that were only on disc as opposed to cartridge. Um, 
there's this is the family computer uh, basic keyboard, family basic, and this was to program your own games. Uh, this was the data recorder. This was to save the games that you had programmed, and and, and, and so you could load them again from cassette. Um, oh, and the 3D glasses over here are pretty cool too. We never got those either. And they've got all the cool stuff. Yeah, they, well, and they had a modem as well. So, oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah, that's sort that. of that's an extension on the computer part too. So, yeah. I mean, more people in Japan, many, many, many more people in Japan had Famicoms than computers. So, yeah. these were ways to sort of bring the stuff that would normally be on a PC to right to exactly. another thing that they already owned and wanted to own. You know, my, my Donkey Kong machine can now do the computer stuff. Right, cool. exactly, <laughs> yeah. Um, and so we have some ephemeral uh, Famicom stuff in here. I don't think it's terribly important to focus on that, but I do want to draw attention over here because uh, we wanted to express the, the sort of slow journey of the Famicom to America. Um, it wasn't just like, okay, cool, hit in Japan, let's put it out in America, NES, boom, that's how it happened. No, it was actually really slow going. It was a struggle for Nintendo. Um, what we got over here are a couple uh, advertisements for what's called the Versus system. And this was the first time the NES was ever in America. It was as these arcade cabinets called the Versus system. And this, uh, you know, played the exact same, well, not slightly modified usually, but like the hardware inside the Versus system was the Famicom. And uh, they released games here in the arcade before the NES even existed. Stuff like Excite Bike and Duck Hunt and uh, a couple others that I'm, I'm not coming to mind, but like Balloon Fight was, was yeah, that was a pretty early one too, yeah. Um, and so, you know, that, that was sort of the, the first attempt at getting the Famicom here. Um, the reason that they couldn't just release a console here was, it's 1984. Yeah, so the, the, the Famicom was released in 83. Yeah. And that is smack dab in the middle of the American game crash. Yep. So, I mean, the, all the toy stores and the electronic shops and everything like that, all of them had just lost a bunch of money supporting Atari and Intellivision and ColecoVision and all that. Like, they, they bought units and then the, game, the crash happened and they're just left with all this excess inventory and they just lost a ton of money, all of them. So, like, suddenly in, like, 1980s America, for, like, this company with a weird Japanese name, like Nintendo, like, like in the, sort of the height of Japanese xenophobia here also, you know, it's like, that's a tough sell. So that's why there's not, like, instantly this... Nintendo in America. Um, so they, they started with the Versus system. They um, they actually pitched Atari. I don't know if you guys know this. They went to Atari. They're like, hey, we're Nintendo. We have this system. It's more advanced than yours. Uh, they actually coded up a couple demos of like Atari arcade games. They're like, we'll port your games for you. You go sell it and just cut us a check. And Atari turned them down. We could have had the Atari entertainment system or something, but we didn't. Um, Sorry, go ahead. Oh no, I was just going to say, so retailers were really kind of game phobic at this time and so Nintendo ended up having to take some kind of, some losses really, I mean. They did, this yeah. was This was a company that was like maybe 30 people at the time yeah. and even the CEO was doing things like setting up TVs and, and that sort of thing. I'm, I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, but. That's uh, okay. <laughs> but it was, yeah. it was a. It was a company that no one cared about and retailers didn't want to touch video games, so they ended up having to kind of get creative yeah. with it. I mean, the first, uh, the first creative way of how do we do this was, you know, maybe we go full family computer, right? And they kind of attempted this, uh, I mean, it's a skewed photo, sorry, you can go see the full thing in the museum. Uh, but they attempted what they call the advanced video system, and it was an NES, so basically a Famicom, but they had like wireless controllers and a keyboard and the other kind of keyboard, both kinds of keyboards, and like a joystick and a tape recorder, and the, the pitch was, oh, it's not a video game. You know, it's, it's like this high-tech thing to be in your house, and you know, they went to a trade show and they tried to sell it, and no one was buying it, so they're like, okay, scratch that, let's go back to the drawing board. And, and they still didn't call it a video game, I and mean, if you notice, it's called yeah. the Nintendo Entertainment, Entertainment System. system. Yeah. It is not a video game system. Yeah. They were, you know, they understood that people were afraid of that word. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And um, they packaged in, once they finally, okay, so they, 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 they go back to the drawing board, they get this new design for the thing, they simplify it, they make it more of a toy. 
they start selling it more as a toy. Like, actually, if you go back and look at the newspaper advertising for, like, early Nintendo sales at, like, Target and stuff, it's like, introducing the robot's entertainment system. You know, like, it's, you know, they, they, they were just like, no, it's a toy robot that plays games with you. That's the system. Um, and so what they did was uh, they're like, okay, we, we can't prove that people still like video games and want to buy them, but we believe that. So we're going to take a tremendous risk. Uh, we're going to just go out and sell it in New York. We're going to have a little test market to make sure that it works. Uh, and they went out and they spent a ton of money. Like FAO Schwartz was the huge toy store in, in, in New York. And they like paid a ton to like convert part of the store into like Nintendo land, you know? Um, and actually this display here, I'm so proud to have in the museum. Uh, this was one of their point of purchase displays from that test market in New York. And I have, why did this survive? <laughs> you know, like why, did, why was this kept in a shed? I have no idea, but it's here and it's amazing. And there's this giant ugly Rob head on top and I love it. Um, so they, they tested it in New York. Um, and uh, well, we have some cool stuff here from that time. Like this is a t-shirt from the launch party, which nobody attended. Like it was a sparsely attended launch party. Again, no one knew who Nintendo was in right. America at this point and no one cared. No one's, no reporters <laughs> are reporting on video games because video games are dead. There's no more video game magazines. Or there's no video game industry at all. So like no one's paying attention to this thing. Um, but they launch it. Um, we got all the black box games together. Cool, um, and you know it's it's eighty five. The, the test market was a success. Eighty six is a pretty good year for them. Eighty seven is just when things went crazy. Like in nineteen eighty seven, uh, the Nintendo suddenly best selling toy in America. Like it, like this word of mouth just kept going, and the marketing was good too. And that's to diminish the marketing, um, and it, it just exploded and. Um, you know, it's it, we started seeing, and Nintendo was brilliant at what I, what I would now call community management, right? Like, yes. we, like we don't think of community management in the old days, but when Nintendo was doing that, then to me was, uh, if you registered, like there's a registration card in your Nintendo, and they're like, hey, you get a free magazine if you uh, if you if you register your name with us, and so. Um, and th that was the Fun Club News. I don't know if you guys have ever seen these. They're, they're dinky little newsletters. They're kind of fun uh, from Nintendo. There's, Nintendo's still pretty small at this point. I mean, they're hugely successful, but staff size is pretty small. They keep getting this user data, and they end up with 3 million NES owners whose like names and addresses they have. And they've been sending them Fun Club News all this time. And they're like, hey, we've expanded Fun Club News. Here's Nintendo Power, full color. Uh, gorgeous thing. They send this thing out, this first issue, to like three million people. And they're like, give us money if you want more. And millions did. And then this became one of the like highest circulated magazines in America. Yeah, and it was just an incredible kind of, you could see the immediate ramp up because people wanted more Nintendo content. Yeah. And being able to get a magazine and see all of these screenshots and all of the upcoming games and all this news. I mean, it was it functioned as a giant advertisement for Nintendo, but also no one interpreted it that way. They we ate it, it up. <laughs> we ate it up. Yeah, we shamelessly <laughs> ate it up. <laughs> we loved it. And right? I, yeah, it's... Sorry, we were going to say something? No, no, yeah. go ahead. Um, oh, just a quick call out over here. Uh, in 87, they were going to... They, they were demonstrating a knitting machine for the attached year NES. That never happened, but you know, a little ad. And I do want to point out something oh, sure. there that might be interesting to people. That, uh, in the frame up there, that is the like oh. original Howard and Nestor uh, <coughs> draft that was sent. You, yeah, you yeah, know yeah. more about this. Sure, so Howard and Nestor was the comic strip that ran in Nintendo Power. And this is like the printer proof that Nintendo sent for the very first Howard and Nestor strip. You know, this is what the, the American editors look like. And they went, you know, Oh, adjusted blue a little bit, but otherwise, you know, good. I don't know why they adjusted the blue a little bit in my <laughs> dream scenario. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Nintendo mania after this, like, just explodes. And we and part of building this museum was just like, we need to represent that, you know what I mean? And you can't, I don't think in a museum you represent the explosion of Nintendo by just having priceless artifacts, you know? That, right. Like, it just doesn't work. I mean, we have one. You know, we have one yes. priceless artifact, the Nintendo World Championships cartridge right here. But, you know, like, we wanted to show just, like, 
There's Nintendo crap everywhere. You get Nintendo birthday party stuff, little golden books, coloring books. McDonald's had Mario toys. There's a whole catalog just full of all yeah. kinds of, I mean, a lot of it, honestly, yeah, is go. pretty crappy. But it's it's just stuff. They knew that everyone wanted stuff with their favorite Nintendo characters or yeah. logos or whatever on it. And again, it was, it was being eaten up because it was Nintendo Mania. And America's just blindsided here. We've, like, at this point, there's never been a hugely successful, uh, like, franchise that came from Japan. You know what I mean? Like, there were Speed Racer cartoons that was kind of big. You know, there, there's some anime and stuff that came over, but really it's just like, all of a sudden, just overnight, everyone knows who Mario and Luigi are. You know, and like, it's hard to think of it now, but it's, you know, 1989 or whatever, it's like, they're Italian plumbers who from eat a, mushrooms. From a and, Japanese company. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, and I mean, Nintendo was just like, Everywhere, like like the, the the word Nintendo just became synonymous with video games, and it, that that stuck for years. I still hear it sometimes. Where it's just like oh, he's playing Nintendo, you know, he's playing Xbox. Yeah, how many of you guys have your mom just call everything? Your I'm seeing nods. Yeah. yeah. yeah you guys know that. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, just more cultural impact stuff. Like the 1989 Ice Capades starred the Super Mario Brothers in these terrible costumes. I don't ice. know why the Goomba is flesh colored, but it's, you really hate that. <laughs> I really like, it do. Really you it's out. it's creepy. What What's creepy to me is the Link mask. With, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to see, but uh, his lip paint is like on his teeth. So he's got like lip colored teeth <laughs> or like teeth that protrude out of his lips. I'm not sure. Um, or very thin lips. Maybe it's that. I don't know. Paper thin. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, like, you know, The Wizard. You guys know The Wizard? Like, 1989, Universal makes this major motion picture with, like, Fred Savage, who was huge back then. Like, th this is this is an actor we were all seeing every week on The Wonder Years, which is one of the, you know, the, the most watched shows on television. And he's starring in this hour and a half movie that's like a Nintendo commercial, you know? And, and like... Uh, you know, they made a movie out of Super Mario Brothers in 93, um, and oh yeah, and what we're expressing here is like, it's not just Nintendo, it's like uh, all kinds of people started getting in on the act, you know, they, um, you know, there's like, uh, this is one of my favorite artifacts from our library, it's uh, Game Pro Celebrity Video Gamers, and it's a magazine where they just interview celebrities from the time, like Fred Savage is right there, and Macaulay Culkin, and that's J.D. Roth on the cover, and they're just interview celebrities about what Nintendo games they like. And every single one of them answered Super Mario Bros. and Tetris. Yeah, every one of them. <laughs> Except Get Macaulay Culkin. Macaulay Culkin owned a TurboGrafx-16 because he was that kid. Wow. Um, and they asked Macaulay Culkin, <laughs> Macaulay Culkin, what are your favorite video games? And he goes, Splatterhouse and Bloody Wolf. <laughs> <laughs> hardcore. Oh, yeah, he is hardcore. Um, yeah, like licensed comic books from third-party games, like Double Dragon, De everyone's favorite, Defenders of Dinatron City, anyone? Uh, <laughs> and once you make it onto the cover of Mad Magazine, I mean, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know that you've really become like, culturally impactful. Exactly, right? right? <laughs> like, like, we've reached the point where you are on the cover of America's, like, parody magazine, right? Um, it was just a spread of, like, books that were coming out, and, like, everybody was just, like, Nintendo tip book, you know? Or, like... A parent's guide to video games so that your children don't become mass murderers, stop stepping on turtles or whatever. Um, you know, licensed comic books. Uh, and what we're kind of showing over here is uh, the, you know, how the NES spread across the world even. So like this is a, a UK version of the system that came with Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles because you couldn't say ninja in the UK in a product, which I don't really know. Um, because they're murderers or something? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> they're, they're cute murderers. Um, <laughs> the Ninja Turtles are not cute. It, it, oh, come on. They're adorable. <laughs> um, and this is the Korean version of the NES, the Comboy. Um, we want to show that. And, um, and so, you know, 1994, 95, it's like, NES is dated. There's 16-bit stuff out there. And the, the sort of market for new NES stuff dries up, and that's usually where people uh, stop the story of the NES. It's like 94, they moved on, but um, I think that's a very, it's a big word I'm about to use, ethnocentric uh, approach to talking about these things, where it's just like, that's a very American perspective, and it's very much the Nintendo perspective, right? Like, like, but meanwhile, around the world, the NES is still happening, 
it's just not called the NES, and it's not being made by Nintendo. Um, really, pretty early on in the system's life, uh, people in Hong Kong had, had cloned the system. They were selling clones of the Famicom uh, for cheaper than the real thing uh, to places where the Famicom wasn't sold, like 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 uh, like Brazil and, and, and China, and. It continued living on these clones uh, past, way way past the system's life, and and it's just and it became because the tech was so you know fairly easy to program for, and because it was so cheap to manufacture, it just became the default like toy game console in third world countries. And they kept developing games based on stuff that was getting popular now. I mean, yeah. you know, the NES was done in the US, <coughs> but I mean, there's. Final Fantasy VII and Pokemon bootlegs yeah. for the you know we call like, them bootlegs like, but they're but they're also important in that someone was actually trying to develop and distribute these other culturally right. important things to their countries using the NES. Exactly, it's like you know we, we tend to like I think a lot of people when they talk about the NES history they're like oh I don't really pay attention to the bootleg stuff because that's just the garbage and it's. Granted, all these games are garbage, but um, <laughs> but like from an historian's perspective, what I want to express is that like no NES development continued. We just tend to disregard it because we have a very American and like uh, copyright friendly perspective. I would yeah, say, well, right? Even collector right. perspective, where it's just kind of like, well, that this is when the last game was released, so yeah. it started and ended here. Yeah, and it, the, this didn't come out in America. It doesn't count, you know. But like. You know, there, there's some original games even that, that were coming out at this time. Uh, mostly, though, is stuff like, I mean, you can barely see it, but it's like, this right here is the, like, Sega Genesis or Super Nintendo Pocahontas game that was, like, downported to the NES. Like, they, they, they did stuff like that. Um, I'm not sure, Matthew, is this, uh, this is your card, right? The, so is this, is this a port of Ocarina of Time, or is this the Zelda 3 one, or what, what game is this, do you know? Oh, it's like it's like uh, like like uh, the oh Oracle the, the Oracle pages. yeah okay so yeah some some company like ported the Oracle Game Boy uh, Zelda games to the Famicom and, and what I think is really interesting is up here is that you know it's not just the default like cheap toy console it's also used in actual educational computers for kids and like some of these were even sold on on the sly in America this this particular example is from Brazil. And you load this up and there's like typing programs and, and language learners and like basic programmers even for the NES. Like this is an NES in here. And this is Montana. I love Montana. It's just called Montana. What is Montana? We don't know. But it's, it's, yeah, I don't know why it's called Montana. <laughs> but, they, but you know, they also, a lot of these clones were shaped like PlayStation stuff. And again, I want, I want to stress that like it's not, it's not like in a lot of these countries you could go buy a PlayStation. They weren't selling the PlayStation in China. You know, like, this was the console you could just afford, the cheap toy console, and they had to keep supporting it. So, you know, system officially dead or whatever, but this other international market, this, I mean, there's games in here from, like, 2006, I think. Like, they just kept going. Literally, there's never been a year where someone didn't make a new commercial NES game. That has never happened. And, like, but since we only tend to think of NES games as things in gray shells, we don't think of it that way. Um, so, uh, oh yeah, there's, there's the, the Magic Computer 95. Um, so, meanwhile, as this is going on, um, in the late 90s, we don't really have a very good example of this, unfortunately, in the museum, but, because uh, there's just no physical artifacts for this, but emulators become a thing in the late 90s. Uh, this is a screenshot from Nesticle, which is a really popular one um, of the time, and, and through emulation, like a whole new generation of NES game developers is born because it's like the, this, this community is like, since they're able to replicate the hardware on their computers, they're like hacking at it, they're figuring out how it works, they're starting to make little homebrew demos and things, and um, and, there's, and some of them are, and, and a lot of them are starting to translate Japanese games. There's a beautiful poster here in the exhibit uh, of I believe 355 completed ROM hack translation patches. Like, it's a thriving scene of people who are just translating these games because they care and they, they, 
and, and they put a lot of work into these because hacking these things is not trivial. Um, and so, you know, while things are still happening, you know, over in Taiwan and Hong Kong and places like that, like we're starting to see amateur developers spring up too. Um, and also, just kind of side note that we put in here, and uh, NES games, even in the commercial world in America, they're still kind of being reprinted just in remakes yeah, for they, other consoles. They did a, a couple, you know, and yeah. in, even Nintendo knew, like, okay, well, everyone really liked Super Mario Bros. 1 through 3, yeah. but we've got this new system now, so let's just kind of upgrade them a little bit, but release them again. It's a little different than, you know, what we've got now, which is just straight up ports of these things. But right. They still, they still were starting to understand that there might be a market for that. Yeah. Um, and so, excuse me. Hi, Montana. Um, so about 2003, do we have, okay, we don't have the tops, that's okay. Um, 2003-ish, a um, couple things happened. Uh, we're now at a point where the NES has become retro, you know, and like it's, it's kind of become cool again in the sense that all old things do. And you start seeing, you know, like collector communities spring up. Like this is a program from Classic Gaming Expo 2003. Um, this is a... a price guide from 2002 that I happen to have because I'm very old and I worked on this. Um, and, and you start seeing the NES games, not remakes, you know, like, like before, like in, in this previous slide, all of these are remakes with new graphics and everything like that. They're like, well, let's re-release the games and make them better. But NES becomes cool and they start actually re-releasing the games exactly as they were. And they do that with emulators. So, you know, the, like Konami here, like here's a, for Windows computers, here's like an emulator with Castlevania and Contra on it. It came out in like 2003 or something like that. Um, Capcom did a collection of stuff for GBA. Uh, these are the Mega Man game remakes for PS1. Technically not emulation, but it's like they look and sound exactly like NES games. They're no longer, they're no longer hiding that, right? They're, yeah, they're right? not trying to take it into the next generation as exactly. like a new upgrade. Yeah, and, and actually these are really nice artifacts here. These are Famicom soundtracks that came out I think in 2001, which was kind of the start of like Famicom becoming cool again in Japan. Um, but the most interesting stuff, uh, you'll have to go to the museum to see, um, but up here you have these uh, plug-and-play systems that start coming out in 2003. I just want to make sure real quick that we don't have uh, photos of that before I make you stare at you. Yeah. Okay, I know. Cool. <laughs> Thanks, honey. Um, there wasn't a, a sarcastic thing. So. <laughs> um, so you start seeing these plug-and-play systems coming out. Um, you, there's one here that's from Konami that's got some Konami games in it, and there's an Intellivision one. This is Atari flashback here. So um, 2003 retro is cool, right? And uh, toy companies like Majesco, uh, they're like, okay, let's release little toy video game consoles. What's the cheap? technology we can use to put video games on. Can they take a note from China, which has been doing it this whole time? Exactly. Famicom on a chip. Right. So they start using Famicom, the, the cloned Famicom chips, and they start making these brand new little plug and plays that have games built into them. But what's really fascinating about this is that these companies start commissioning new NES games to go on these sticks. So like this Konami one right here, it's got three old Konami NES games, like Russian Attack and Gyrus and one more. But then they commissioned three new ports of their old arcade games. So like Frogger, like, like Konami ported Frogger to the NES in 2004. Like that's, that's weird. Like that's, but that's this industry that was popping up and it's not because like, oh, the NES is the best system, let's make it. It's just like, no, that was the thing that you could buy from China that was the cheap toy video game console that you could manufacture for like a buck at this point, you know, like that, and that's why they did it. Um, Atari Flashback is another one. Uh, you guys remember the Atari console that has uh, games built into it, right? The original Flashback, that's an NES. And so these are reprogrammed yeah. Atari yeah. games to work on an NES. Yes, yeah, so like they hired people to re like recreate old Atari games. They made them look like old Atari games, but it's running on an NES. The Intellivision one's the same way. Um, and, 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 it's, and it's like creating this sort of, you know, like the, there's this almost new industry of new NES developers that are just like, and, and it's actually the same guys who've been making these clone games, but they're now getting work from America 
for official licensed products. And it's weird because you don't think about this as NES development. I mean, especially if you see an Intellivision, Intellivision games in a plug and play, you yeah. think of that as Intellivision, and understandably so. I mean, it doesn't say NES. Because they are trying to hide the fact. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, I mean, while it may be like cheap stuff you can find at Walmart, it is important to the evolution of the NES. Exactly. Story. And that's that's kind of what we wanted to express in this museum. It's like, this is all NES. This, like, the NES just kept going. Um, so, you know, uh, a couple years later, well, really about this time, just right after this, uh, that hacker community that started in the 90s, they've matured quite a bit. They really know how the system works. Uh, they're starting to make and then manufacture brand new games for this system. And there's this sort of emerging market of, uh, you know, game collectors who've been collecting NES games that want more. And so, you know, to fill this market, we start seeing things like, uh, like Sudoku up here. It came out in 2007. Um, this is a really important artifact here, actually, to the story, which is, this is Garage Cart. I forget what year this was, like 2004 or something like that. And this is kind of considered the first commercial homebrew uh, for the NES. It was a guy burned 20 of them. Good luck finding one if you're a collector. <laughs> um, but I mean, they, they start not only making brand new games, they also, like these two here, these were commercial games that were made back in the day that weren't released. So the fans just kind of made their own bootleg versions of them and published them. Um, these two here, these are like, composers were creating albums of, of music that ran on Nintendo. Um, and uh, as this is going on, um, as you can kind of see up here, uh, Nintendo makes its own emulator. Yeah, so and an interesting side note to that is Nintendo actually hired one of the guys who worked on an early fan emulator, Inus, yeah. um, hired him to be one of the two engineers to create this emulator. Now, they've been working on it since like 99 or 2000, but the first time we saw it, the first time that Nintendo actually officially put out something that was NES emulated was in Animal Crossing in 2001. If you guys have played Animal Crossing, you might know that there are uh, NES consoles you can find and play in them. They each play just one game, but that's an emulator. It's just, it's just built into that. So that was the, that's Famicom for the 2001 one, because that's the N64 version of Animal Crossing. But then the NES had some different games when they re-released it in the US. And after that, they started going and doing these Game Boy Advance games. They put a bunch of NES games on Game Boy Advance and re-released them so that you had a physical, I mean, these are just literally the NES game you bought back in the 80s. Yeah. But now you can play it on your Game Boy Advance. Yeah. There's nothing I mean, there's nothing fancy added to it. It's just, do you want to play you know, Zelda 2 again yeah. but on your Game Boy Advance? And we had like 18-ish here, and then in Japan it was over 30. So just they <laughs> individual, like here's an NES ROM with an emulator on a cartridge. Here you go. Um, and, you know, and like it's, there's a real market for this stuff. You know, not just actually on, on NES cartridges, but also people wanted to buy NES games for their modern systems. And, uh, you know, this continued on. Uh, this is sort of the end of our display that we have. Um, but, uh, you know, the NES Classic Edition, you can see it up here. It's like, not only did Nintendo sort of take the playbook from the emulation community and, like, you know, use emulators as a way to republish these games, they also took what was happening with the plug-and-play guys in 2003, and they're like, well, let's do you know, they, they combined the two into the NES Classic Edition, which is a plug-and-play NES emulator. Um, and uh, what we wanted to express here at the end is, like, the NES is still going, and, like, it's stronger now than it has been in a long time, and we don't know what's going to happen from here. I mean, um, you know, NES games are still being re-released for modern consoles. Uh, the 8-Bit Adventure Anthology here is the old... Uh, uh, adventure games from um, did a Kemco uh, did those, so it's like Shadow Game, Deja Vu, and Uninvited. Um, Super Mario Maker, you know, technically, but you know, it's like the Super Mario Maker I, I, we put in here because it's like there's no way that game happens without the fan hacking community that was like hacking NES ROMs and figured out how the games worked and creating, you know, 
like a, a weird sub niche of, of NES game fans. Right. Like, I mean, how many? You had a, a nice thing that we didn't get to display that was like what sixty different Mario. That was games. about one hundred and fifty Super Mario hacks. Just Mario hacks. Oh, there's way more than that yeah. too. Oh, I yeah. just, It was just like I got tired of yeah. downloading screenshots. <laughs> Um, NES Remix, I think, is a really clever way of emulating the NES games, where it wasn't just like, here's a pack of old NES games. You guys played NES Remix? Yeah, it's really cool. It's just like, you know, we'll emulate the NES game, but we'll change the rules. We'll, you know, and we'll, we, we made little mini games out of it. Uh, Mega Man Legacy here is one that I actually worked on, and it was the six original games, and it, a million copies. We sold a million copies of Mega Man 1 through 6 on consoles. Like, that's how healthy the demand is for this stuff. And then, like, to me, something I never anticipated um, was that companies are now starting to reissue their old games on NES cartridges, right? So, like, the biggest example is that Capcom and I Am 8-Bit uh, reprinted Mega Man 2. Uh, and what they sell, like... 5,000 copies or something like that? I thought it was 8,000. It's 8,000? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> there's an NES game that came out this year that outsold a lot of console games that are new. <laughs> like, and that game already came out in that exact same format before. And you like, can buy means... it in like a million different places, <laughs> but like the demand for having it on an NES cartridge is big for some reason. Um, Data East licensed some of their old NES games to uh, Retrobit, and they, they made a cartridge. Uh, this DuckTales one here, actually, I, I think of as the start of this. This is a promotional giveaway for the HD remake of DuckTales. Like, Capcom actually made new DuckTales cartridges and painted them gold. Um, these here, I think, are really interesting. Um, so the Oliver Twins, they made the... Anyone here ever play a Dizzy game? Got, oh yeah! Oh yeah, man! Yeah, you too. <laughs> like four people or something. Dizzy. Dizzy is a, Dizzy is an egg, so it's an egg having an adventure. And uh, the Oliver Twins, they made a bunch of these back in the day on on uh, computers mostly, but they ported some of them to the NES. A bunch of them came out, um, but they had in their attic just they still had the ROMs for some of the Dizzy games that they worked on that they never published, and so they actually like. They went to the rights holders, they got clearance and everything, and they, they made brand new NES carts for games that they had made back in the day, and they're now officially releasing. Uh, and they found three unreleased Disney games in their attic, which is like, what? Like, <laughs> and they just found a fourth one? So, like, <laughs> this is, these guys, I mean, I, I, I kind of, I'm really fascinated by the Oliver twins, just a quick side note, sorry, but like, they're identical twins, and I think their brains are just weirdly in sync, and they just sit down together at two computers, and they just work with each other, and they crank out a game in like a month, and then they move on to the next one, which I guess results in an attic full of yeah, games. Yeah, there's more more Disney games, we don't know. And then something else that's really fascinating in here, this is Galf, you guys know Galf, anyone? Yeah, yeah, so, um, so there's a game on the Switch, a fantastic game to go download and play called Golf Story. It's kind of like a golf, Action RPG is, I guess, the best way to describe that. I only say action because the action is hitting a golf ball. Uh, but you're not like fighting people uh, with a golf stick, uh, although that would be kind of fun. Maybe I didn't beat it, so I don't know if you can beat it. Yeah. <laughs> but there was a fake NES game in that game called Galf. And uh, they made, I don't know who made it, but like uh, a, a, a real NES version of Galf was officially created, sold on limited run games. 1500 copies. And gone in an instant. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's reselling the pre orders. This isn't out yet. Yeah, it's not out yet. Uh, yeah. But the pre orders for this are up on eBay reselling because there's such a huge market for this NES game within a Switch game that now is it's on an its own <laughs> NES cartridge. Yeah. And it's like, I kind of wanted to end the exhibit here because to me, this is an open question. It's like, is this going to keep going? Like, is, 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 reissuing NES cartridges going to be like vinyl records, right? Where like things are getting reissued on vinyl, like this antiquated format that you need like old hardware to use. Like, is that the future here? Um, and then, oh, and, and actually we, we, we wanted to show this too, because I thought this was really interesting that, you know, not only had the, the fan community that was hacking at these games, not only were they publishing new games, uh, Brian Parker here like made a new system that is the NES with like a whole like launch series of brand new games for his NES system. Like like it's there's no other system like this. 
there, there is no other system that just never stopped. Um, but you know, you have to sort of know where to look for it to know that it never stopped. And there's no other system that uh, had this level of commercial appeal for brand new games. And um, I don't know, like, I can't, Kelsey, can you imagine this happening with it? I, I can see it. Like, I don't know, Super Nintendo N64 maybe? Like, I could see that community maturing, but I don't think so. I don't think so either because this was such a, it was like a rebirth of video games, right? I mean, and, and I think there's something nostalgic and important to people that makes them keep coming back to the very, to them, the very beginning. I mean, the Atari... The beginning of good it, video games. Right. I mean, there were plenty of video games before that, but this is the beginning of when, like, okay, everyone's kind of on board that these are fun now. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't think thought they were fun before, but they were just, like, quick toy things. You right. know what I mean? Well, then yeah. they're, like, replayable and re... Like, I want to continue to consume yeah. this. That's what I meant by uh, that. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, totally. You just hate Atari. I don't hate Atari. <laughs> um, and yeah, like I just, I don't know, I, w I want, if there's a takeaway here, it's like, think outside the complete inbox. You know, like it's like, don't, don't think of the NES as these great cartridges. Like the NES is this platform that has inspired so many people to make all these weird demos and games and was, you know, was serving as like, a really important niche in places like Brazil and China of like letting people play video games without having to, you know, you know, within their means, right? Like like buying these cheap phone consoles and uh, go play some weird strange NES games. Thank you all for coming.